It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, February 23rd, 2012. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Well, pretty good. Had a good day in the gold and silver market. And yep. uh, I don't have the I don't have the spot prices yet. But the outside market April gold was up uh, Ten dollars at seventeen eighty one sixty, and it was up as much as sixteen ninety where I saw it. So they took some profits at the end. Not unusual for the traders. Silver thirty five fifty up one sixteen, and that was up strong all day. And um, saw a lot of shorting uh, in the comics uh, via uh, derivatives. Uh, as well as in the shares. Shares were up on the day, but um, uh, not as much as they should have been. And um, all of these markets are affected by the same thing, and that is uh, by the major brokerage houses, no matter who's doing it. Uh, You're looking at massive naked short selling in everything. And I mean, I mean everything. And I talked to a trader today, and he said, such and such a firm has a whole floor of new people, and all they do is short stocks. Sadly, Bob, that really doesn't surprise me. Well, one of the companies has had a seven-month complaint in with the SEC, and we know they investigated. So we know they uh, know what's going on. And unfortunately, you really can't sue them because they'll hold off for five years and drag you through the court and cost you a lot of money and you get no results. But that is uh, the it, it, the U.S. government's behind it. Uh, otherwise, the SEC wouldn't be re- breaking the rules. <clears throat> and they are breaking the rules. And so you're going to see a lot of merges among smaller companies that have synergy, you know, no matter what they're in, they're, they're shorting everything. And so uh, I think that what will happen here is that um, eventually uh, either the SEC will be forced to act or uh, perhaps one of the investigative reporters that writes for one of the big magazines like uh, Rolling Stone or uh, Vanity Fair or one of them uh, maybe one of them would get onto one of these and show the public what's going on I mean it's just like the elections every one of them is rigged yeah, definitely I mean that's a very good comparison there Bob they're, they're both shady as can be and speaking of the stock prices uh, I've been following this today as well along with gold and silver you have oil and gas prices going up. Uh, oil has shot over $108 a barrel. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's a fallout fundamentally from what's going on between the nations that use Iranian oil and the Iranians. But, uh, you know, there's more to this than that. The oil price is being rigged, and we're never going to be able to find out because we can't access the information. Uh, they caught one group doing it. About two years ago and about six months ago, they fined them and did other things. But they're stealing billions of dollars, and nothing's done about it. I mean, it's everything for banks and Wall Street and heck with everybody else. Absolutely, and it's happening everywhere. As you mentioned a moment ago, uh, what are they doing with gold and silver? The same thing's happening with oil and gas, food prices, and all the commodities. Well... I I did a piece. It's in the editorial section for Saturday, and I don't usually put things like that in there. But it's how the National Realtors Association, whatever it's called, uh, how they are putting out totally false information and have been for a long time. 
in order to make people think you know, things are not as bad as they are, and they'll go in and buy real estate. And it's tragic because it's a perfect example of what the government and American business is doing. Nobody tells the truth. I mean, do you think the banks mentioned that they get two sets of books and it's legal? It's unbelievable. And so it's very, very hard to make decisions, not only uh, about purchasing stocks or bonds, but even people who run companies, they can't trust the government or other corporate statistics. You know, what are they to do? I mean, there's not much they can do because, I mean, the – <laughs> the crooks are running everything, and as you and I both know, Bob, the, the crooks have their crooks paid and bought and bought and paid for in the government, so they, they're basically running the asylum. That's right. It's a tragedy. And it's just sad because, you know, so many people now have been ripped off because of the uh, real estate bubble scam and so many other instances. I mean, the list goes on and on in that, in that regard. I mean, it's just new Ponzi schemes pop up all the time. When you're looking at houses that drop from... 350 to 154, uh, no rhyme no reason. Just ridiculous. And, of course, the bank should have never made the loans, but they did. Then they packaged everything and the bonds into uh, one bond, or the mortgages into bonds, and then sold them all over the world, let everybody else worry about it. They are getting sued, but it's chump change. I mean, they stole $3 trillion. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, Seven is, trillion dollars in real estate values were lost. Yeah, uh, I have somebody that lives in Las Vegas, and she was sending me some information about uh, some houses she was looking at, and I was just floored, Bob. These were brand new, brand new houses too, basically in nice areas in Las Vegas, and they were going for like sixty, seventy grand when you know a couple of years ago they were worth way more, at least three to five hundred thousand dollars. That's right. And it's a ghost town, and it's going to get worse. Don't buy there. I mean, there honestly, some places you can take risk on, but if you're a speculator. But the bottom line is you don't want to be there. You have to have an awful good reason for buying a house. Like your yeah. monthly payment will be $800 on a 20-year mortgage, 20 down, and the rent in the same area is uh, 1200 Then it might be worth it. Exactly. But don't forget, it's going to drop another 20% in value in all probability. Houses dropped two and a quarter percent last month, 2.4 actually. And so it's not getting better. No, it's not. It just seems like every moment that you think it, it can't get much worse than this in the housing market, then like you mentioned a moment ago, I mean, they drop it even further and further. And before you know it, I mean, already in most neighborhoods across the country at all levels, I mean, upper class, middle class, lower class, you see homes for sale. I mean, I've seen homes for sale popping up all over the place, and they continue to say, oh, we're out of the recession and things are getting better. But, I mean, I mean, from my own perspective, you know, go, going down the street, I live in a rather decent neighborhood, Bob. I mean, homes are still going up for sale. People are still losing their homes. I mean, how exactly are things getting better when it seems to be getting worse? Well, and I think they're going to be in for a surprise here. I think probably the Dow will back off here. Somewhere between 1050 and 1250, and it'll happen pretty quickly. And then I think uh, before the year is out, they'll make another move back up again, uh, give it a rest. And uh, you know, it's uh, not an uh, not an unusually hard choice. You look at bonds; it's a net loser of 9.2 percent considering inflation in U.S. Treasuries. And you go over to the market, you, you know, you've got to go in there if you've got money and you want to gamble because it's the only place you've got a shot at it. Although it's way overpriced, uh, it's still, you're not going in on the negative. I mean, how anybody can buy a treasury, they have to be insane. Yeah, I mean, it's just sad because they, you have so many people out there in the, in the market, you know, recommending to their clients, hey, you got to buy this, you got to buy that, and it ends up being nothing more than a huge ripoff for the uh, customer, and it's only the brokers and all these firms that end up profiting. Uh, you should see the letters I get. You don't even want to hear about them. That's just sad. That's how bad it is. Yeah, it's, it's just. And then you know, people will liquidate their accounts and they don't want to send the money out to them. I've never seen anything like it. How they make excuses? Well, we got to hold it for this or that, or we're checking this or that. They send it out eventually, 
and I don't know what their motivation is. I think perhaps hope, they're hoping that you'll go back on the market in the next two weeks, you know? And that's a, that's what it sounds like to me, Bob. It sounds like they're basically holding your money for ransom. A ransom. And Bob Chapman is my guest. His website is the internationalforecaster.com. And speaking of the Dow, I wanted to get your thoughts on what happened a couple days ago. Now, they made a big deal about this in the mainstream media about how, oh, boy, oh, boy, uh, the Dow you know went over 1,300 points. What was the real driving force behind that, Bob? Yeah, it's hard to say. I, you know, I have to be on the scene that day. I can't remember every day in detail. You know, people say to me, well, why is gold going up? Well, it's been suppressed again for four months because the U.S. government knew what was going on over in Europe and what the outcome would be. <clears throat> and so what they did is they suppressed gold and silver. At the same time, they incrementally took the market up a little bit. And that kept everybody happy. It's just, you know, corporate fascism, one control after another. They do anything they want to do. Yeah, and, and that's how I see it. I see this uh, jump to over 13,000 points. I think I said 1,300 a moment ago, so I apologize about that. I see that as nothing more no, than... No, 15,000 on the Dow. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I see it as nothing more than an illusion. You know, it's just, you know, they're giving people the false impression that everything's okay, everything's going to be hunky-dory, so go ahead and open up your pocketbooks and, you know, dump your money into the stocks, and we'll, we'll rip you off once again. That's right. Terrible. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. I mean, when you see those statistics, you read my issue for Saturday, and it's the last item under the editorial section. And I said, I don't usually put this in there, but you've got to see this. And they revised the figures from previous months to come out with a stated outcome. It's criminal. And not anybody on Wall Street or banking, nobody, none of the uh, major media said a word. Of course not, because as... You know, we all know they're in on it. <laughs> they're they're culprits. They're collaborators. They're you know working this scheme together. That's for sure. Yeah, but sooner or later, I think I think the not just the people of this country, but so many other countries right now. I mean, especially what you see going on in Greece. I mean, they've been rioting for what nearly two years now over all these austerity measures going on. And I mean, I, I got to hope, Bob, that sooner or later the American people are going to get to that point where they get fed up. I mean, it came out earlier today, uh, one of the senators came out with this chart saying that America's per capita government debt is actually worse than Greece. Yet, wh wh where's, where's the outrage? Where's the anger? There isn't. They don't know what to do. But they will, because they listen to programs like this. And finally, when they don't have any money and job and house, they'll revolt. Simple. I mean, look at big cities, uh, places like uh, Los Angeles. 500,000 gang members armed to the teeth. I mean, do you really want you to have to face something like that down? And that, that's a very scary number. And you have, you know, that number, in, well, not as big in Los Angeles and other you know, some places, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand people. But still, you're right. I mean, once it, the bottom falls out, because it's coming sooner or later, if the you know food and gas prices continue to go up, and I've already saw a couple articles earlier today how there's a lot of anger uh, at uh, gas stations. A lot of people are going into the gas stations, talking to the attendants and clerks, angry about how the prices keep jumping up. You know, ten cents here, you know, five cents here, and it's not really their fault. The clerks and attendants, they're just working, trying to make a living. You know, on barely minimum wage, but there definitely is a motivating factor behind all of this, and it's going to be one of the reasons why I think you're going to see more and more people start to really lose it. And they will. They will lose it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a question of when, and nobody knows yet. But it'll happen. And uh, I don't know what's going to be the moving force, but um, whoever they are, uh, they're going to be in harm's way in a big way. Yeah. And I, I can just feel it, Bob. I can feel it more than Last year, I can feel that something's coming. Maybe not this year. Maybe this year we might make it through 2012 okay. But once we get to 2013, I have this, this bad feeling in my gut that all bets are going to be off. Well, that evolutionary time 
from the second half of 13 through 15. And it could be very monstrous. Uh, we won't know until we get there. But um, if they keep on pouring money in, well, inflation and purchasing power will uh, keep changing, uh, inflation going higher. And um, the next step is uh, how do I feed my family? And, and that right there, Bob, how do I feed my family? How do I put food on the table when you have you know, a wife or a husband and starving kids at home? That is what turns normal, everyday citizens that follow the law, pay their taxes, are good people, into desperate criminals that are willing to break into other people's houses and rob and even kill just to take care of those closest to them. And that is a big fear for me, is that we're going to see that happening not only in my country, in, in the U.S., but in countries throughout the world. No, I think you're right. I hope not, but, uh, you know, that's the way things point. And, and it goes back to what you've been talking about for a very long time now. You, you've got to be prepared for this. You've got to be setting aside some storable food, some water, some, you know, gold and silver, and learn how to grow a, a garden. You have to be preparing for what's coming our way. I mean, best-case scenario, somehow by some miracle, and I'm not really a big person on miracles, that, you know, things somehow turn around, and I, I would like to believe that, but, you know, the, the facts speak for themselves, and it, it doesn't exactly paint a pretty picture. But we need to be out there preparing. Everybody listening right now, and you're going to say this in a moment. You're going to go into detail about this, I know, as you always do. You've got to be preparing for what's coming our way. And very few are. You're looking very at uh, people that should be buying dehydrated and freeze-dried foods are doing nothing. They think somebody else is going to support them. And I get news for you, that's not going to happen. And if you try to bang into somebody's house to get their food or get fed, uh, you're going to be met with a hail of gunfire. Yeah, I mean, th there is always the possibility of getting together with some family and some neighbors that you really trust and have gotten to know over the years and work together in, in the event of such a situation as we're talking about. But most of the time, it's it's not exactly like the 50s where everybody knew everybody back in the day, back when, you know, neighbors knew neighbors where they left doors unlocked. Of course, that's what they say they did back in the day. Now, you, you well, really did. I was here. So, I mean, for the most part, I guess that, that there is some truth there to that story. But nowadays, most people don't even really associate with their neighbors. I mean, I've tried to ever since I moved into my house a couple years ago. And I do talk to, you know, two or three of my neighbors every once in a while, once every blue moon. But for the most part, I don't really know anything about them. And fortunately, they don't know much about me, which is kind of a good thing because you don't exactly want to snitch for a neighbor, someone that's a little too nosy. But I, I think that the fact that we're losing that, that cohesion that neighborhoods once had where everyone knew everybody and knew their children and knew who exactly was you know, part of the neighborhood and who was a complete stranger. I mean, that that's lost on the modern society. Well, I think the conditions drive people away, too. They don't know what to do, and they don't want to admit that they got a problem. Yeah, definitely. And, and once things go really bad, then it's um, unfortunately going to be every man and woman for themselves. I mean, if, if you don't have a very close-knit of friends or family, it's going to be very hard to trust anybody else, especially – when, I mean, they're not bad people, but they're going to be desperate people. And as you and I both know, and you look back at history, you look a couple of years ago what happened uh, in New Orleans after Katrina and several other instances. I mean, desperate people will do very desperate things in order to survive. And that's true, believe me. Moving over to uh, the European Union now, Bob, with uh, what's continuing to go on there. What is the latest regarding the uh, situation in Europe and Greece? Well, three countries have to approve that deal, which are Germany, Finland, and uh, Holland. And there's a whole bunch of other things that have to be cut. Uh, now they put up their gold, 111 tons, as collateral. And uh, I think that's the worst possible thing they can do. And we're supposed to get an election in six weeks. and But all of the damage is going to be done. And so if Samaras wins, he's going to have to 
come in and say we're changing the rules. Uh, we're not going to do that. It definitely sounds like a, a trying situation in Europe right now. And uh, I just can't believe for the life of me why any country would even contemplate putting up their gold reserves as collateral. But at the same time, I, I would have never fathomed Greece putting up their islands in historical landmarks for sale. And they've done that. Well, it's the leadership in the country, which is uh, that which is in office. You have an appointed president a longtime member of the Trilateral Commission and an Illuminist selling the country out, and they desperately want to get their hands on that gold. And uh, it's sitting at the Greek National Bank, which means they can't go on and take it out any time they want. Um, we'll have to wait and see what Samaras does, but this is going to be an ongoing problem. The rules that have been set up can't be lived up to. They're going through that in Portugal right now. And they're asking for changes. And of course, the bankers don't want to give up anything. And the economy is collapsing. And if they don't change the rules, the economy will collapse, they'll default, and nobody will get anything. These bankers are always going for broke, think that they can pull it out. And uh, can they? Uh, I don't think so. I think this is going to go on for some time, and it's going to help gold and silver go up. Bob, do you always think that bankers had this mentality are to be so greedy that they, they'd be willing to strip a country of everything and basically in the end even doom themselves and their own family and future generations? just to make a buck? I mean, is this a new thing, or is this something that's been going on, unfortunately, for a very long time? For a very long time. Because what, what's going to happen now? You know, they don't care or what's going on five or ten years from now or whatever. They just don't. No, it's, it's just one thing that has always bothered me, because the, the truth is we're the only species on the planet that requires money to survive, and, it, and that's kind of a joke i mean it's kind of a, a sad reality that we live in at the same time and i mean sooner or later i mean the this money that they value so much in the end is probably going to become completely worthless the dollar the euro whatever currency comes next and <laughs> then what are they going to be left with nothing but they believe that they're going to be in control and there's a set of rules, and uh, and the rules were created by them, so they're going to be okay. And then occasionally in history, about every one or 200 years, you have something that goes against that, like the French Revolution. And they took them all out and hung them. No, they didn't hung them. They cut their heads off. <laughs> 30,000 people, 10% of the population. Yeah, and, and I think we're getting no, very close to... one percent of the population, I'm sorry. One <laughs> percent. <laughs> yeah, but I, I honestly, I think that if things continue to go this way and they continue to, to continue their little game of trying to rob every single country in Europe and the U.S. and the rest of the world the way they have been, eventually you're going to see uh, history repeat itself with a massive global French-style revolution. Probably. And that's not good for the bad guys because uh, they're going to get it, and they know it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have been uh, been waiting for a lot of years for this to happen. No doubt. I mean, there's a, you know a growing number of the populace throughout the world, uh, thanks to yourself and so many others that have been out there trailblazing, waking up people to the reality of the situation that we face. You know, breaking through this this programming that the you know governments and the the propaganda machines of the media have tried to keep on the people. Now, yeah, obviously there's still plenty of people out there that are on the couch, sheeple, jellyfish, zombies out there that'll believe anything the government and the news tells them. But unfortunately, those numbers are trickling away. It's kind of like sand falling through the hourglass, and more and more people. As things continue to get worse and worse and the situation deteriorates around the world, are going to be waking up to what's really happening. And you don't need a majority of the population 
in the the country of the U.S. or any other country to rise up and go grab some torches and pitchforks. I mean, that, I mean that's basically the, the, the point here is that sooner or later, Bob, I mean, there's going to be a final straw where the people are going to have enough. You and I don't know when that's going to happen, what the scenario is going to be that uh, facilitates that. But if things continue to go the way they're going, we're going to see a massive uprising and it's, like you said a moment ago, it's not going to be good for them. Well, especially uh, that they've uh, held this coveted position as uh, uh, the grand poobahs of society for so many years. Uh, and then big changes come. Uh, they can't handle them. Um, they cannot handle them uh, mentally, emotionally. I mean, a perfect example of that is you, you take a look at what's happening in the uh, GOP primary right now. I mean, it's basically coming out of the woodwork that there are shenanigans going on in all these state primaries and caucuses against Ron Paul. It's, it's coming out. Uh, they're trying to hold it in like they've b done for so long now. But, I mean, that, that dam that they put up has a whole bunch of cracks in it. And there's a lot of water starting to seep through, and it's only a matter of time before that dam bursts. The question is, when will it be? You'd like it to be now. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, never it, thought I'd see the Republicans do what they're doing. You know, these people, are there. they got to be out of their minds. Yeah, me either. And I was you know, raised as a Republican. My grandfather is a conservative Republican. You know, he taught me conservative values when I was a kid in my teens. And I believed when I was younger and dumber before I woke up to all this that the Republicans were the good guys and the Democrats were the bad guys and the Republicans could do no wrong. Of course, I, I came to realize that that was a lie, especially after uh, the lie of uh, Iraq and the fact that the neocon controlled uh, administration and the uh, Congress were pushing all these police state laws on us. That That's when I became really disillusioned, Bob, with the whole two party show. And yeah, I mean, it's just sad because they're no longer conservatives. They, they probably never really were. It was probably always controlled at some form or fashion to at least some level of corruption. Now it's, it's gotten out of control, and both parties are really one and the same now. It's like there's been some sort of behind-the-scenes merger, and they just pull on this uh, fake wrestling for the populace. Who did you say that com company was? Oh, the the two. Uh, I, I was just using an analogy, Bob, that the the two party puppet show had some sort of secret merger in the background, and the truth is there there's really no difference between them anymore, none whatsoever. No. I mean, it basically is one big giant company. They, you know, they they came in, they they had an agreement, they came together, kind of like uh, what Mobile Exxon, and that's the way I see it. But I think the good news is, Bob, you I mean you have a growing number of Americans right now are angry with both parties, they're angry with the president, they're angry with Congress, with the government in general, and they're not exactly happy with the uh, three uh, other choices for the GOP. I have seen nobody out there with any Gingrich or Romney or Centaurum yard signs or bumper stickers. I, I see plenty of Ron Paul stickers out there in yard signs. I've even seen a couple of Obama stickers, believe it or not, but you know, there's always going to be Kool-Aid drinkers in the bunch. So it's just hard to believe that there's actually anyone out there that's realistically going to back or support any of those three candidates come Election Day. Well, I think uh, the power that Obama has is a welfare power. power. I mean, he'll give them anything, and they know it. And the other guys are talking about cuts, and they don't want them. You know, cut off my extended unemployment? You've got to be kidding me. I mean, how am I going to sit around and watch television all day, every day? Not that they want to. Don't get me wrong, they want to work, but um, if, there's no, if there's no work, uh, there's no money, and, you know, you've got to help people, or people think that they should be helped. And Mr. Obama believes in that. And uh, nobody... nobody uh, Hardly anybody uh, prepared for the rainy day. We've been having rainy days for almost four days, four years. And it's continuing to get worse and worse. And and that's just the the mindset, unfortunately, that the American people have had for the past number of decades. 
we went from basically an independent society to a uh, dependent society, and that's where all these uh, different, you know, un unemployment, welfare, uh, et cetera, come into play. We traded freedom for safety. That's a takeoff on Jefferson. <laughs> no, it's, it's the truth. You're absolutely right about that. I mean, we, we decided to, uh, you know, somewhere down the road, we decided that, hey, we were going to let the government just take over and run amok, and that's exactly what they've done. And, it's and they just, will continue to do it. And it's sad because, I mean, Obama knows he has that card in his hand. He has those people that are out of work right now. You know, the, the numbers continue to go up, and you know, a lot of them depending on those unemployment checks, Social Security, welfare, just to survive. He knows he has those in his pocket. Plus, he has the unions in his pocket, and he has so many other groups in his pocket. And when you look at the other three guys, Romney, Santorum, and Gingrich, I mean, they're, just, they're not exactly winning over the, the masses. But, I mean, there is one candidate, as you and I both know, that is out there that, that can defeat Obama if he was given a real chance. And, unfortunately, as we've seen by the mainstream media and the uh, neocon-controlled GOP establishment, they really are doing a number on Ron Paul, but that still hasn't stopped him from staying in the delegate race. He's he's picking up delegates left and right, so I think he's definitely going to be a force to be reckoned with. But it's just sad that that they're so blind, Bob, that they can't they can't see a, a good candidate when he's standing right in front of them. Well, it's the art of propaganda, and the other side has been winning for a long time. Yeah. They, they have been winning, but fortunately, we're starting to turn the tide against them. It's a, it's a slow process, I'll admit that. And like we uh, talked about a moment ago, yeah, I, I would definitely like for all this to turn around now. I mean, better sooner than later. I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in that <laughs> regard. But I, I just think that, you know, we just got to keep staying the course. We got to keep doing what we're doing. And there are many people out there all across the country, different walks of life, who are avid Ron Paul supporters, who are doing everything they can to help uh, wake up fellow citizens to Ron Paul. And, you know, we're not winning everybody over, but what, what counts, Bob, is we're winning over, you know, more people at a time. We may not be getting uh, 10 out of 10 victories when it comes to the populace, but we're, we're getting, you know, a good chunk of those people, you know, on our side. And if we continue to go this way, it's only a matter of time before we have enough people to actually do some good. Well, we're going to get the time. Whether we'll get the political cooperation remains to be seen. Uh, that's going to be a hard one. Because um, lots of people are listening, and they're converting. But we've got to get more than what we're getting. And if we lose during this election, uh, you can rest assured that there'll be, along the line over the next two or three years, plenty. And that's after the election. Uh, plenty of real problems. And um, you hate to see that, but that's the way it is. Bob, paint a picture for everybody what the country is going to look like and the direction we're going to head towards if we get Obama reelected or, dare I say, one of these other three clowns such as Romney, Centaurum, or Gingrich. Well, you won't have much change at all. They'll all do the same thing. More welfare, more deficit spending, uh, more corporate fascism, um, employment, and um, probably start picking up people who are outspoken like we are and putting them in camps and um, things along those lines. But. Your freedom is gone. You're going to have to win it back. And there's only one way you can do that. Yeah. I mean that, and, that, and that's a sad reality that I, I wish that we didn't have to lead to. I mean, I, I want to turn things around peacefully. I think most people want that as well. They want a peaceful restoration of our Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And I, I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. But, I mean, the good news is we are continuing to wake up people and continuing to, to try. And that's what really counts, in my opinion. As long as you were willing to get in the ring and try and give it your best, then at least you did something. Because if you're just going to sit, sit on the sideline and say, well, we're not going to win anyways, 
well, basically, you're not, we're, we're not gonna, uh, it's not going to magically happen if you don't do anything. So that's why so many of us have been out there doing what we've been doing for you know, a while now, yourself and many others, Bob. It, it just comes down to the facts that, that if we don't get Ron Paul in the White House, like you said, we're going in the same direction. It doesn't matter if it's Obama or the other three guys. We're going to have more of this corruption, more police state, more government, and unfortunately, more wars. I get a letter from the Middle East today. A veteran, contract government employee, uh, been there 16 years. And he said, you know, I couldn't figure out what was going on until I listened to your tapes and then saw your publication. He said, now everything falls into place. And there's so many people out there, everywhere. They're in the same position. All they knew, need is a little direction, and, and we've got to find a way for them to take notice. Well, I'll say this, Bob. What you've been doing for the past several decades now has accomplished that. You have been waking up people. You have made people realize what's really going on, such as that contract worker in the Middle East right now. I mean, I mean, he's just one of countless examples that before, you know, he came across what you're doing, you know, all the shows you go on and the, your publication, the International Forecaster, you know, he couldn't connect the dots. But you were there as a, as a teacher, as a professor standing there, you know, putting it out in, in plain sight for them and like, you know something? That makes sense. It all makes sense. The pieces fit. And that, that's something that, you know, without you and without others there, I mean, the situation, I think, would be a lot more dire for uh, civilization as a whole. Well, you're probably right about that. It used to be pamphlets in the 60s and 70s, and we never had enough pamphlets or enough people who were interested. And uh, then came the Internet and talk radio, and that changed everything. And if we'd only had that in the 50s, we wouldn't be where we are today. I agree. I mean, the, <laughs> the Internet should have came around a couple of decades sooner, but I'm glad, I'm glad it's here. But as you and I both know, uh, they're working really hard to – you know, limit and censor the Internet. I mean, what they tried to pass uh, SOPA and PIPA a couple of weeks ago, and that met a huge backlash, and they, they shelved them for now, of course. Uh, they'll eventually bring them back to, you know, some other form of capacity. They never give up when it comes to their police state laws. And you had, uh, what, uh, Rockefeller, uh, the sen what, Senator Jay Rockefeller, he talked about, you know, how he wished the Internet never was created. And that shows you exactly how their mindset is, these elitists. They, they don't like the Internet at all because of the damage it's done to their agenda. That's right. Absolutely. Now that, that's that's why be they go up on the Internet and pull my stuff down once every day now. Get a lot of people writing in. It's not there anymore. Yeah, it's just amazing how far they're willing to go to uh, keep the truth from getting out, but... You know, we'll, we'll continue to spud it out, you know, you know, get, continue to churn out the truth machine with, you know, all the different shows that you go on and all the different hosts out there and all the different uh, champions of freedom and liberty, not just for the people of the U.S., but this, this is a fight for the whole of humanity, for the entire planet. So we got people fighting this on all over the world, on all four corners of the planet, you know, doing this, what you've been doing for so long now. And, and that is something that they cannot stop. They cannot kill and stop an idea whose time has come, as you know, a great philosopher once said. Uh, that's the root of the situation, uh, the continuity, continuity of uh, information. And uh, unfortunately, there were only a handful of us. And um, the arm is all dead now, except myself and uh, G. Edward Griffith of the old group, and that's, that's it. And we're still cranking it out and helping people. It, it is sad that so many have already passed that, you know, we're at the forefront for, for so long now. But I, I do take into heart that there have been a number of people out there, Bob, that have picked up the torch and are carrying on the fight, and those numbers continue to grow. Now, uh, do uh, a lot of us have a long ways to go before we reach that level of knowledge and experience? Of course. I mean, that's just the way it goes as you get older. I mean, it takes time for you to develop that knowledge and, and get smarter, get wiser. 
But I, I think that it's in the long run, I think you're going to have even more uh, champions uh, for the cause out there. And, and that's something that I think really scares the powers that be to death, knowing that our numbers are only continuing to grow. And that's true. They are growing. They are growing. And, and that brings me to one final point. I mean, and this is something I've been doing for the past couple of days, Bob, is we got to start taking better care of ourselves, especially with all the, the crap that they put in our food and with so many other things going on in the world. we got to start physically doing better to ourselves. I mean, I've been eating a lot healthier in the past couple of weeks, and I've started doing this crazy thing called going outside and sitting in the sunlight for a couple minutes a day. And I've been doing it for maybe two or three days now, Bob. And I got to tell you, I feel way better over the past couple of days of doing that than I have in a long time. Well, you're bringing nature into your life. Exactly. And it's, it's just sad because I'm, I'm so used to being inside working on things all the time that I, I, I rarely get outside, you know, except for when it's, you know, already too late and the sun's gone down. But, you know, I, I made up my mind, you know, especially since it's been such a nice week here, you know, the sun's out shining and the birds are chirping, <laughs> that I said, you know what, I've got to get outside. You know, I've been feeling kind of like in a rut. I need to get outside. I need to get some sunlight. And it, it works. I mean, I'm, I'm proof positive that if you go outside for maybe 30, 45 minutes a day and just, just stand there and just let the sun, you know, shine itself on you and fill you up full of vitamin D, I mean, it'll, it, it'll make a world of change. And that's true. And, you know, we, we get healthier physically and mentally, and that ensures, Bob, that, you know, we're going to be around for the long haul in this fight against the powers that be. And you have to. Absolutely. And we got about a minute left, Bob. How can people get the international forecaster? The forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. Published on Wednesdays and Saturdays by email. Running around 30 to 45, uh, 30 to 40 pages uh, each time. And uh, we have a hard copy that goes out twice a month. And that's for those who are not on the internet. And everything you need to know each week is in that publication. If you'd like a free introductory copy, you go to the internationalforecaster.com. The international F O R E C A S T E R dot com. You can also go to www.intforecaster.com, dot com. Intforecaster dot com. If you have a question and we answer them all, like a copy, or if you'd like a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares, email us and our addresses. Bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com. Bob at Intforecaster dot com. And for those of you who would like to call toll-free, that number is 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. And you can get copies there. And if you'd like to be a subscriber, they have a special offering there. Free one-year subscription. And I think the offer is terrific. Take advantage of it. I think the offer is terrific, too, Bob. And thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I will talk to you next week, sir. Well, thank you. And thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.